Hi everyone and welcome to Newegg TV. My name is Paul and today by special request we have the highest of the high-end Z77 socket 1155 motherboards available from Gigabyte. This is the Z77X UP7. The last motherboard that we saw from Gigabyte that has this color scheme as well as this design philosophy was the legendary X58OC. That motherboard was designed for Intel's prior enthusiast level socket 1366 and it was specifically geared towards overclocking and that is what uh, Gigabyte has gone for with the Z77 XUP7 as well. Already we have seen right here on the box a world record 7.102 gigahertz uh, overclock on a Core i7-3770K and this board really just has tons of features geared towards overclocking, benchmarking, and generally attempting to set records. Power delivery is a big feature right here, 32 plus 3 plus 2 phase power delivery. It's a UD5 motherboard, uh, it won an award for Best of Computex 2012. That includes some uh, extra nice features such as built-in uh, dual band Wi-Fi and Bluetooth 4.0. This motherboard is Windows 8 ready. It is an Intel motherboard, of course, uh, it supports Intel processors. It has a Z77 chipset and the 1155 socket, so it will support both Sandy Bridge or second gen Intel Core processors as well as Ivy Bridge or third gen Intel Core processors. And bear in mind, if you want PCI Express Gen 3, you're gonna need to use an Ivy Bridge processor. I'm imagining the most popular processors with this board are probably gonna be the 3770K, and the 3570K, although it would also be interested to see what you could do with the Sandy Bridge 2600K or 2700K. That being said, here's a look at the back of the box. There's lots of stuff listed off here. You guys can take a closer look if you want, uh, but there's some additional information about the uh, construction of the motherboard, for example, as well as a lot of the high-end components that Gigabyte is using to assist with overclocking. Next up, let's take a look inside the box and see what all Gigabyte has included. They've included a plastic protective cover for the motherboard itself, which is in there. We're going to close with that. And then, oh wow, lots of accessories in here. So let's start off, uh, we have some Wi-Fi, uh, well, it's not integrated Wi-Fi, but they do provide you with a little uh, single link PCI Express Wi-Fi riser card right there. So a PCI uh, Wi-Fi card, dual band, so you get two individual antenna, and you can, uh, it's got some nice cable length there, so you can position those antenna wherever best suits your needs. Here are some leads, and that is to connect to the voltage read points on the motherboard. We also have bridges. Oh, wow, there's lots of bridges in here. Ooh, a four-way bridge. All right, so these are all SLI bridges. No, they're not. Correction, we have a crossfire bridge for two-way crossfire. We have a four-way SLI bridge here, rigid PCB design. We have a three-way crossfire bridge right here. I'm sorry, three-way SLI bridge here. Uh, again, rigid PCB design, so should be set up for most SLI configurations as well as a couple crossfire configurations. Here's also your two-way SLI bridge and that's a flexible design so you can fit if you're going whether you're going with four, three, or two slot spacing that one should serve your needs. You also have a bunch of SATA cables. We have this external adapter kit that I've seen Gigabyte include with some of their boards which gives you a little bit of external functionality. I'll come back to that. You get a Gigabyte case badge, of course, if you want to put that in your case. Gigabyte user's manual for the UP7, as well as the whoop, driver disk right there. Don't use these drivers. Download the latest from the Gigabyte website. You also get, uh, this is probably for the wireless, yes. A little separate manual for the included wireless card. Multilingual installation book, book if English is not your first language. Uh, let's take a look at serial ATA cables. We have one, two, three, four, five, six serial ATA cables. In each of these packages comes two, and uh, of the two, one has a L bracket on one end, the other has two straight brackets. These are all black cables, and I like the assortment here because uh, you got L brackets on a few, you got straight plugs on some of the other ones. That should uh, allow you to connect all the serial ATA drives that you need to. Gigabyte has also dropped in a little 3.5 inch drive bay USB 3.0 converter right there. So two USB 3.0 uh, plugs on there and a 20 pin connector that you can plug straight into the motherboard. So if your case does not have USB 3 on the front, you can add it as long as you have an open 3.5 inch bay. Uh, this, what is this? This is a USB adapter. Hmm. USB header to a four pin header, and I'll try to figure out what that's for specifically. You also have a rear panel IO shield, of course. It's a kind of the squishy on the back that provides a little bit of extra electromagnetic shielding. Uh, and this little kit 
This is actually an eSATA kit um, that, that Gigabyte drops in with some of its boards. It's a little value add item. It gives you a PCI bracket at the back. PCI bracket actually has a Molex plug and a couple eSATA plugs. Uh, the Molex plug you can connect uh, via this internal header and plug that into your power supply and that will power that Molex connector. And then it's got a little Molex adapter here, a little cable, so you plug that in and that gives you two Molex plugs. Uh, you can also actually you plug that in, it gives you two serial, two, uh, serial ATA power uh, connectors. And then you also have a couple uh, eSATA, um, yeah, eSATA to regular SATA cables right there. So you can connect that. That will let you uh, route a couple hard drives, plug them into the motherboard directly. And uh, next up, I'm going to figure out what this thing is for. Okay, figured it out. Uh, this is a USB header that plugs into your motherboard. Other end of it is just a little four pin USB connector and that plugs into the included Wi-Fi adapter. And now we're taking a close up look at the motherboard itself. Here's a look at the back just so you can see the PCB. It is sort of a flat, maybe slightly glossy black, but mostly flat black. So you can see they put some extra reinforcement here behind the heat sinks for the power delivery. And uh, all of the heat sinks on the board are attached with Phillips head screws. So you can remove those if you decide you want to. Flipping around here to the front of the board, I'm gonna start off by pointing out fan headers. You get seven total. I'm gonna point them all out and tell you if they're four pin, or three pin, most of them are four pin. So you have one up top here, that's four pin. Another four pin right here, that's for the CPU. Another four pin right here next to the memory slots. Another four pin down here in the lower right. A three pin right next to that. Another four pin down here next to the debug LED. And then one more three pin right here in the lower left. Does that make seven? I hope so. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yes, that's your seven fan headers. Next up, we're gonna look at the board in detail, close up and we're going to talk about everything that's on the surface. We're going to start in the bottom right. So down here in the bottom right, uh, first off we have a reset switch, and that's kind of separated from the power switch and the rest of the buttons on the board, but it is there and available and surface mounted. Uh, next to that, of course, the aforementioned system fan headers. You get a USB 3.0 connector there, a 20 pin. You actually get two of those. The other one is up there by the memory slots. You get a debug LED, so that's going to help you uh, fix post errors if you get any of, the, any of those that pop up, and it will show you the CPU temperature when it's not doing that. Now there are of the aforementioned system fan headers. You also have these two switches right here. You notice an MB and an SB. So this board has the dual BIOS function that's been uh, implemented with a lot of Gigabyte boards, but you actually have a little bit more uh, options with those. SB will simply turn the dual BIOS on or off. MB will let you switch actively between one of the two BIOSes. So that gives you a couple options. You can use that for uh, recovery, or you can, for instance, set up a low power underclock setting. So for use that for general uh, internet browsing and then switch it over to an overclock setting if you're going to do something more serious like playing games or editing video. Next to that, we have your front panel connectors. They're all color coded and you get a little chart underneath it to tell you which ones are which. Next to that, we have a few USB ports. So the red one here is going to provide additional power for charging devices. Standard USB 2.0 port next to that. We also have a COM port. We also have another of the aforementioned fan headers. We got some SPDIFs. We have both ins and outs for the audio, which is controlled by a Realtek ALC, I believe it's 898. Just a moment. Yes, I'm right. Realtek ALC 898 audio codec uh, integrated on this board. The little chip for it is right there. And uh, also you have your front panel audio connectors. Next up, we're going to talk about PCI Express. And this is one of the areas where Gigabyte has spent a lot of time to give you plenty of options and also to allow for uh, getting really good overclocking and benchmarking results. So you notice all the PCI Express slots right there. You have a total of five full-length X16 PCI slots. They are wired for X16, X16, X8, X16, and X8. And bear in mind, again, if you have an Ivy Bridge processor, you're going to get PCI Express Gen 3 uh, functionality out of all the full-length slots. If you're going with the Sandy Bridge, you only get PCI Express Gen 2, so bear that in mind. You also have a couple single-speed PCI Express connectors. Those are also Gen 2. Now, all of the green, I'm sorry, green, all of the orange uh, PCI ports that you see here are all connected through a PLX chip. So that is actually a switch. It's located right underneath this heat sink. That's giving you extra PCI express lanes. So you can, for instance, set up two-way, three-way, or four-way four Crossfire X or SLI configurations. But they're also acknowledging that a lot of folks only use one card. 
uh, using multiple cards is a, isn't quite as common. And also, when you're routing your uh, PCI Express lanes through a, uh, a switch like the PLX chip right there, it gives you more lanes, but it also introduces just a little bit of latency. So if you're looking for the best possible performance for a single graphics card, you can connect it to the black full-length X16 port right there. And this one connects directly to the CPU. It doesn't route through that PLX chip, so that's going to give you the best performance for a single card. I would also recommend, if you're going to go with a two-way configuration here, you can use this top port and this one. This will give you uh, triple, triple slot spacing, so you have a little bit of extra space in between your cards. That's assuming, of course, you have a two-slot uh, video card that you're installing. And then, of course, if you're going for three-way or four-way, you can use all of the orange slots that you see right there. So plenty of options there. Also plenty of PCI Express bandwidth if you're going to go for multi-card configurations. Moving on over here to the right, we can see a fairly large heat sink that's black and orange, and that is over the Z77 chipset. The Z77 chipset is controlling quite a few things on the board, especially down here in the Southbridge area, but one of the things it's controlling is this little M SATA slot. So the Z77 chipset has a built-in peripheral controller hub that gives you some serial ATA connectivity. That will control these six serial ATA ports right there. The white ones at the top are the fastest. That's serial ATA revision three, six gigabits per second. Also, you have these black ones here. That's serial ATA revision two, three gigabits per second. And also bear in mind that if you are going to use this M SATA slot right there, if you have a little 1.8 inch SSD, that your SATA slot number five is uh, taken up by that. So you won't be able to plug in directly to, I forget, it's either the top one or the bottom one right here. It does list that in the manual. Also, for additional serial ATA goodness, we have these four extra ports right there. Those are controlled by a couple add-on Marvel chips. Uh, they are Marvel 88SE9172, and uh, those are, uh, of course, serial ATA revision 3 compatible. You can also do RAID 0 or RAID 1 off of those chips. Uh, and then I should also mention that with the Intel-controlled uh, serial ATA ports up here, you can also do RAID uh, 0, 1, 5, or 10. Moving up the side of the board just rotate it a little bit here, uh, you actually have a little serial ATA power connector and what that is for is additional power for your PCI Express uh, connectors over here. So what Gigabyte is recommending is if you have just a single card plugged in, no need to connect any power to that. However, if you are going to go with a two or a three or more card configuration, you are going to want to plug in a serial ATA power connector from your power supply to that to provide a, a bit of extra juice to those slots and make sure that your cards are running as they should. Next to that, we have another uh, front panel USB 3.0 20-pin connector. Uh, above that, we have another of those fan headers I mentioned at the beginning, 24-pin main motherboard power connector. And then moving up the side, we have some of the more exciting features over here, and this is going to be for your extreme overclockers. First off, at the top here, you have an LN2 switch. So uh, as you may or may not know, if you're using exotic cooling sub-zero temperatures, sometimes it's difficult to get the board to boot. So this is really just for the extreme enthusiasts over there. You can switch that on if you're using exotic cooling, and that will uh, allow you to boot up a bit more easily. You also have a clear CMOS button right there, surface mounted power button, and then you have these gear buttons right here. These will do a few different things. The plus and minus right here will automatically increase or decrease your multiplier. So for example, if your multiplier is set to 42 and your standard uh, frequency is 100 hertz, that will give you an overclock of 4.2 gigahertz. Below that, we actually have some B clock uh, uh, buttons right there. This will incrementally increase or decrease your B clock or your base clock. And uh, you also have the gear button right there. So by default, these little plus minus buttons will uh, increase or decrease the B clock in increments of one tenth of a megahertz or 0.1 megahertz. Uh, by switching the gear button, you can adjust that to one third of a megahertz or uh, by pressing it again, it can go just one megahertz. And the reason this is so helpful is because sometimes with really high end overclocks, it can be difficult to actually boot properly. What this will allow you to do is boot, get into your Windows operating system environment, and then push the overclock even further. Again, this board's just designed for overclocking, and that is one of the features they have that will allow you to break some records, as they have already done with this motherboard. Finally, some other features right there. Uh, next to it, you have some uh, attachment points for some leads, and that's for voltage, me voltage measurements. They have included... I already put those away, but they have included some uh, leads that you can plug directly into those, or you actually have the direct contact points. You can connect a multimeter to that and get very accurate voltage readings. Okay, we're moving on to the actual CPU socket right there. Pretty standard. That's your 1155 socket for your Sandy Bridge or Ivy Bridge processor. Surrounding it, we can see 
all of these chokes and you have a total of 32 of them on the board uh, for CPU power delivery. So 32 phase power delivery for the CPU. And again, that's surrounded by these uh, pretty decent heat sinks that you can see. I say pretty decent, actually quite beefy. So you have some aluminum blocks here at the top of them. You also have individual fins running along each one. That's gonna allow air to actually flow through that, dissipate the heat more uh, efficiently. And again, just keep your temperatures down on your power delivery and uh, give you better overclocking again. You also have a heat pipe that's connecting all of the heat sinks on the board. The top ones here for the power delivery, also for the PLX chip, also down here for the chipset. And that heat pipe's just gonna allow the uh, heat to move to wherever, whichever of the heat sinks is currently coolest. And uh, again, aid heat dissipation, keep your overclocks more stable. Finally up here for power connection on the surface of the motherboard, you have not one, but two eight pin supplemental CPU power connectors. And if you are going for crazy overclocks, make sure you have both of those plugged in and make sure you have a high end power supply. Above that, on the aforementioned system fan header. And now we're moving on to our inputs and outputs on the IO panel. So over here we have a combo PS2 port for a mouse or a keyboard. Uh, we have two, four, six USB 2.0 ports here on the back. Uh, if you have a Sandy Bridge or an Ivy Bridge processor, you have an integrated GPU or an iGPU, at least in most of those different versions of Sandy Bridge and Ivy, Ivy Bridge processors. So if you're not running a discrete graphics card, or if you want to make use of Virtue MVP, you can actually use these for your video outputs. And they've pretty much covered everything. So you have a 15 pin D-sub connect connector there for a VGA output. You also have a uh, DVI connector right there for your digital output. Uh, you also have HDMI. Uh, HDMI, the VGA, and the DVI can all do up to 1900 by 1200 resolution. Then you also have a display port connector right there that can do 2560 by 1600. You also have an optical audio out. You have a couple e uh, gigabit ethernet ports. You have both an Intel and an Atheros uh, ethernet uh, chips on the board. So uh, the Intel is gonna be your better one there, but you also have the Atheros as a backup. And then finally, you have your analog audio connectors right there for your Realtek ALC898 audio chip. And I thought I did a really good job and covered everything on this board. And I did it all in the first try, by the way, but I, did, I neglected to mention our memory slots. So we have four uh, DDR3 memory slots right here for DDR3 memory, of course. It's dual channel, so you're gonna wanna install sets of two sticks at the same time. And I'd, uh, ideally, you're gonna want those sticks to be the same capacity, same brand, and the same speed. Uh, the Ivy Bridge, uh, Processors in, in particular have really good internal memory controllers, uh, so they can hit some pretty high uh, memory frequencies. I've seen uh, 2400, 2600 even. Uh, officially support from Intel will go up to 1600, uh, but this is gonna support 1.5 volt DDR3 DIMMs. Uh, you can get up to 32 gigabytes uh, total if you go with eight gigabyte DIMMs. And again, uh, overclock speeds 1600 and beyond. And that is gonna wrap it up for this video, guys. Once again, this has been the Gigabyte Z77X UP7 motherboard featuring the Z77 chipset, crazy amount of overclocking features, and of course the 1155 socket for Intel second or third generation core processors. I'm Paul with Newegg TV, and if you enjoyed this video, you can find more just like it on our Newegg YouTube channel. And of course, don't forget to subscribe. Thanks a lot for watching, and we'll see you next time.